All right, welcome to Christian Overcomers, and thank you for joining us for this Bible study. Signs in the Stars. You know, up until this point in this series of studies, we've talked about how different conjunctions, different alignments of the sun and the moon are used to determine years, months, um, and, and even the feast days, as well as the weekly Sabbath days. But we haven't really talked about the stars or the constellations or the planets. And we know that they do play a part in keeping time as well as giving us signs of prophetic events because of Genesis chapter 1 verse 14, where God says that he, he um, created the sun and the moon and the stars to determine those things. And, and so that's... So today we're finally going to get into the signs of the stars, uh, the constellations, and um, well, we won't get probably too much into the planet, in, into the details of the movements of the planets in this study. Um, but we will, we will uh, give a little bit of an overview here. Now, first, I want to just say that we're not talking about a pagan astrology here. For pagan astrology is nothing but a perversion of God's sacred truth um, displayed to us in the heavens, among the constellations. And that, that's where a lot of people go wrong. You know, the first, you know, because we, we think of uh, palm readers and, and people like that, whenever we talk about movements of the stars, the signs of the zodiac, and things like that. But, you know, Satan perverts everything. That's God's. Satan even works them in Christian churches. So just because Satan works in Christian churches, should we say that the Bible is bad? Is the Bible evil because Satan uses it and twists it? No. Well, the same applies with the signs of the zodiac, as well as the planets and the stars and their different formations. Because Soon we're going to start teaching the book of Revelation. And it's, in, it's important that we have at least a working knowledge of the different signs of the zodiac because many of the symbols, signs and symbols used in that book of Revelation are actually constellations among the stars. Think about that. So without that, not without knowledge of the different constellations of the Bible and the of the Bible in the stars, so to speak, it would be kind of hard to understand the Book of Revelation. For example, in Revelation chapter twelve, we're given two specific signs of the zodiac, or signs of, or constellation signs, and they are Draco, the dragon, and Virgo, the virgin. And then we're talking. Then, and then within those constellations, there's mentioning of of stars and and the sun and the moon. So the Bible is actually full of astronomical signs. In fact, again, you go back to Genesis chapter one verse fourteen. One of the first teachings in the Bible in the fourteenth verse, we are told that the sun and the moon and the stars are to be used for signs. So way back in the elementary principles laid out for us in God's Word is the fact that, yes, indeed, God does use the stars to bring a message. To bring a message. And, um, you know, in the, in the coming months here, I think we're going to probably try to plan it out just prior to or around New Moon Day. Um, if you don't know what New Moon Day is, go back to our, uh, go on our YouTube channel or our website and find that video titled New Moon Days or, or Months Equals Moons. And you'll know what I'm talking about. But somewhere around that time, probably right on that day or prior, our goal is to start doing um, a monthly um, uh, signs and season videos. I guess we'll call them something like that. I haven't determined what we're going to call them for sure. But anyways, what we'll do is we'll look out, you know, at what's coming ahead with astronomical signs. 
You know, what, what signs is God going to be displaying in the heavens? And, we're, and also, we're just going to look at the natural workings of the calendar, of the regular rotations of the zodiac and the, the sun and the moon and the stars. And we're going to try and look to it. And we're going to try and decipher, if we can, different um, um, conjunctions that may be telling us something that uh, as a warning. But we're not going to try it. I'm just going to say this, we're not going to try to read something into every different conjunction and, and determine absolutely some event's going to happen. But we are to watch. We are to observe. That is our calendar. That's what God gave us. He didn't give us a piece of paper for a calendar other than different things we are supposed to, um, how we are supposed to count off the feast days and so forth. But He gave us His creation. And, it, you know, it's beautiful when we come in tune with the creation, with the Creator's calendar. It just, it feels like it brings you one step closer to Him. Anyways, I'm going to stop rambling on here, and uh, we're going to open up in prayer, then get right into our study. Heavenly Father, we just pray for wisdom and understanding in Your Word. Um, we, we just stand in awe at Your creation, at the vastness of Your universe of the galaxies, the stars, the solar systems. And we realize how big you are, Father, and, and sometimes how small we are, but yet you love us and care for us as much as you do. And we thank you for that. We ask for eyes to see and ears to hear as we barely start scratching the surface of um, the uh, signs and the of the stars and the planets and the and the constellations that give us the signs and the seasons of of our life and of your plan in Yeshua Jesus name we pray amen all right please turn with me to psalms chapter 19 and this is where we're going to base most of our study off of today psalms 19 i know some of you who have studied for a while may be pretty familiar with this chapter it's basically the, the, um, the foundation, if you would, of any study into the stars, into the constellations, into the zodiac. And it's a fascinating chapter, and it was, and it was written by King David. And um, I, again, it's, it's commonly known as the astronomical psalm. And let's just start reading, and you'll see, you'll see what I mean. Um, Psalms 19, verse 1, and it reads, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth His handiwork. Now, you can take this psalm on many different levels. We're going to try to reach out and grab on, a, you know, get up there a couple steps anyways today, but we're also going to look at the basics of it. Just, just go out at night sometime. On a family vacation, if you live in, in the inner cities and so forth and you never see the stars, get out into the country and look up when you can see all the stars. Look up, find a place where you can actually see the Milky Way. And look up and just, and just stand in awe of the Creator and His glory and all the things He made. You know, sometimes we get tunnel vision. I mean, there are, there are a lot of beautiful things on the earth. Uh, that God has created in nature, the animals, the planets, and, and, and so on. But sometimes, you know, we need to even look up so we realize that God is much bigger than the earth and even bigger than the heavens, if you would. Anyways, it says, the heavens declare the glory of God. In other words, when you look up, you should, you should just, uh, again, realize the glory of God just by looking at His creation, just by looking at the stars, and the planets, the sun, and the moon. Not, not to worship them like the heathen do. Not to make gods out of them. Not to become a sun worshiper, a moon worshiper, a palm reader, or something like that. But just to be able to acknowledge the, the um, immensity of our Creator. This is fascinating. You know, this word declare actually um, in the Hebrew, it actually implies 
rep by repetition. You know, there are certain things that happen over and over again in the heavens that don't seem to be really anything new. And we're going to kind of go in and show some of that here in a little bit on, a, on the uh, screen here, on the computer. Um, I'll just take a real simple one, the year. The earth travels around the sun once every year. That's by repetition. And in doing so, it teaches us a lesson. We'll get into that in, in a second here. But anyways, that's the way God teaches. But also, there are things that happen in the heavens that aren't by repetition, that are part of longer cycles or just events, uh, different movements that are unique in themselves. And uh, perhaps we might get into that. So let's go to verse 2. Day unto day uttereth speech. Now this verse is really fascinating to me um, because it lets me know that there's a lot we need to learn. From the heavens, from the signs of the zodiac, from the stars. And it says, day unto day utter a speech. He's talking about the heavens, the space, or the, you know, everything you see up there. And night unto night showeth or revealeth knowledge. What does that say there? That every single day, the stars speak to us. They're giving us a message. They're trying to tell us something. Sometimes they're telling us something. They're repeating the same uh, overview of God's plan by repetition. And sometimes they're pointing out to us something that we need to know. Even Christ himself said, hey, as we get towards the end days, he will show us signs and s signs uh, in the heavens as well as on the earth. Um, we'll get into that. Maybe not today again, but I just wanted to bring that up real quick yet there that Christ d did teach that. But this also for you deeper students. Well, let me, let me just go to verse three here. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. In other words, it doesn't matter where you live on the planet. I guess unless you're, um, you know, you, you can't see the night sky because of uh, light pollution and so on. But what he's saying is everywhere around the globe, you look up and the stars are above you. They're giving a message. And for the deeper student here, and I don't know how much we'll get into this in this series anyways. Maybe we'll go into it more in our monthly updates. But... Um, they actually give, they, they give a language. They speak to us. They talk to us. Now, it is, it is entirely possible that when you have different planets in different, in different uh, signs of the constellation. Now, if this is over your head right now or too deep and you're just beginning, just let this pass on for now. And, you know, after, you know, you keep up with us here in these studies, uh, some of these things make mo may make more sense to you. Anyways, when you have different, um, all those different signs of the, uh, all the different constellations all of the heavens, they appear to move in the same pattern all the time. But the planets, they're called wanderers or wandering stars. And they'll move from constellation to constellation, as well as comets and things like that, and the sun and the moon. I guess what I'm trying to say for you deeper students is that when those planets are in, those wandering stars are in those different constellations, it's pointing us out a picture of something. And if you're familiar with the old ancient Paleo-Hebrew, you'll know or you'll remember that each letter was actually not just, you know, an arbitrary bunch of lines, but it was a symbol. It was a symbol. And what they did was to make a word is you'd put a group of symbols together and it would make a word. Well, that, pos that very well possibly could be what's happening in the heavens on, on, on different days. Every single day, you know, when you have Saturn in this constellation, Mars in this constellation, 
they're putting their finger or pointing at the different uh, um, symbols in the heavens, almost like letters. And if you could combine them all together, perhaps there, there is a star language. Um, again, that's supposition at this point. It's something we may go into further at, down the road. But I just wanted to bring that up to give you food for thought. I'll give you an example of the old Paleo-Hebrew. The word Zadok. Again, many of you are probably familiar with that Hebrew word. It means righteous or just. But when you, it, it even means more than that. There are three ancient Paleo-Hebrew letters that make up the word Zadok. You have Zade, Dalet, and Kof. Um, three consonants. And Zade means, a, it means like a, to go forth an army going forth to war. And Daleth means a door or an opening. It actually looks, it is a picture of a door. And um, Kof is a symbol of, uh, I believe it's like a backbone and then a circle around to, to represent a head or intelligence. So when you combine those three different ancient letters together, you get more than just righteous or just. You get a warrior, a, a, a warrior priest who opens doors of understanding for the people. He's, he, he's an intelligent one, a wise one. That's what it means. So it means so much more when, combined to, when combining the letters together. And when we get into the different signs of, that could be shown to us, they mean more when things are pointed out to us by different wandering stars, and then you combine the message. Anyways, um, again, if that's over your head and that's you know that that just sounds uh, kind of confusing, just just let it sit and come back to it at a later point. So here we go. Their words. It says their words again. There. Um, pretty much kind of letting us know that they do give a message. They have their own language, so to speak. In them, he has set a tabernacle for the sun. Okay, God placed, um, you know, you think of all the different uh, constellations around there. They're like a tabernacle for the sun or a home for the sun. And you'll see, you'll kind of see what this is. Uh, I'll show you a picture here in a second here on um, Stellarium. And this will this will make some of this will, you'll just be able to see it a little bit better, which as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, which is as a bridegroom the sun is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. His go, verse six his going forth is from the end of the heaven, and his circuit or his circle unto the ends of it. And there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. What's this talking about here? The sun comes out of his um, chamber and, and runs around in a circle like a strong man running a race. What are we talking about here? Well, this is talking about how the sun makes its circuit, its yearly circuit, through each sign of the zodiac. Each of those major signs. Now, there are 12 signs of the zodiac. And then each one of those signs of the zodiac have three other minor signs that give us a total of 48 different constellations. Different constellations. And we're going to take a look at that here. Um, this program here is called Stellarium. And we did a little brief uh, overview of this in another video. So we're not going to go into that today. But this is something you can get for free. You can download from Stellarium's website. And it's a fascinating tool. Anyway, so here we see here different constellations in the heavens. And you can kind of play with it here. You can, you can move it down there so you can see more. Um, you got here, you got, you're looking south. You can look to the east. You can look north even. And then we'll just go back and we'll look at, we'll kind of position it to the south because that's usually where from our from the northern hemisphere, that's where we see most of the movements. But here, really bright here, is the sun. And 
I have a date and time pointed out here. This is the year 2013, October 14th. And this is the time here in military time, 1532, which would be uh, 3.32 p.m. So I guess what I'm going here for is so we can get an idea of how the sun moves in its circuit or appears to move anyways from our point on Earth here. So what we have here, actually, I'm going to do this real quick. Let us look at this as, as an overview so you can kind of see where we're going with this. All right, here's the sun. Here's the earth. And as the earth goes around the sun, you see different, um, the sun appears to be in different constellations, different signs of the zodiac. And it always goes around on this path here, this red path here, called the ecliptic. It's, you know, an imaginary line that the sun, uh, the sun appears to travel on as the earth moves around the sun. So right here, we'd have the earth here. Whoopsie. Let's go backwards on that. You have the earth here. You have the sun. And then back here, you have a different uh, sign of the zodiac. And uh, that one, I cannot tell by looking at it without a picture which one that is. But anyways... That's what we're going to take a look at on Stellarium. We're going to see how this moves around. And here, let's get another picture of it. This actually is better here. So you have the Earth in the middle. And let's just say the Sun is right here where my pointer is. Then you'd say the Sun has moved out of its chamber and now it's in the constellation of Leo. And it goes around like that. We're going to talk about how the Sphinx, I believe, even documents this, that the Sphinx has the body of the lion and the head of the woman on it, which I believe represents the, the starting and ending point of the Zodiac. It starts with the woman, the first advent, Christ is born through the seed of the woman, and you travel all the way through God's plan here till you reach the second advent when Christ comes back as a lion. So out of the chamber, traveling all the sun travels all the way around. Again, appears to travel all the way around. Then ends at Leo the lion there. That's the ecliptic path. The apparent path, here we got it right here. The apparent path of the sun as seen from Earth. All right, let's go back to Stellarium. Let's take a look at this in real time, so to speak, here. And... Um, we will move the days here. Here's the month. This is October 14th of this year that passed. Now you see the sun's in Virgo. Well, let's watch this move. See how the sun moves? Now it's in Libra. These other things moving around, you'll see there'll be planets and the moon. Let's scale back our time a little bit here so we can see this better here. Okay. So now we're into November. It's going through Libra, Sagittarius. Capricornus, or Capricornus, Aquarius. Now it's going to move up through Pisces. And I think it jumps there because of daylight savings time, possibly. Um, then we go through Pisces. Then we go... Now we'll, we'll just kind of bend this a little bit so we can see it here. We got Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, Leo, and then back to the woman. See how that works? Pretty fascinating. Pretty fascinating. So that, that's your ecliptic there. That's what it would look like at the same time there that I had every day. The sun just keeps moving throughout each sign of the zodiac on the ecliptic. I don't know if you can look at it this way or not. Let's see here. Let's just pick 11 o'clock here. Let's, let's run through that again. I'll move the date and time here. 
just say and the sun just keeps move, revolving around that ecliptic there as the heavens turn appear to turn but it's the earth moving around its orbit around the sun but that's what it looks like that's what it looks like what happens okay so i hope that gives you kind of a good idea of of how the zodiac works and because the reason that we go into this is because um here in this verse here, it says God has set a tabernacle for the sun like a home and it travels through all these different houses. And, you know, from Numbers chapter 2, it says that um, each tribe of Israel actually had a standard that they went by, a flag or a sign or a symbol. And it is thought by most scholars um, that their symbols were uh, according to the signs of the zodiac. Twelve tribes... 12 signs of the zodiac, which would kind of represent the sun, kind of representing Christ, um, going through and visiting with each one of his um, tribes, each one of his people in his house, the house of Israel. Anyways, fascinating. Let us um, go back to Psalms 19 here. And it says, um, okay, his goings forth is uh, from one end of heaven from the, uh, and his circuit from the end of it. Okay, we read verse 6. Now, in verses 1 through 6 of this psalm, we have all these different um, astronomical things laid out for us. And then it'll appear as though it changes in the second half of this psalm to um, non-astronomical um, things. But what's neat about this is if you look at the verbs used in the second half of this um, psalm, and it appears as though David did this intentionally. I have no doubt. All the verbs have to do with different astronomical movements. You'll see what I'm talking about here. So now we go over to verse 7. He says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Now, where you get this astronomical verb here is the word converting. It means to turn. To turn like a heaven, heavenly body, like the sun or the moon or the earth or a planet. To convert, to, to turn back. So that's what, God, that's what uh, David is saying here. Hey, God's law is so perfect, it turns back the soul to Almighty God, like a planet moving throughout the heavens. And, um, you know, that, there's a good verse. You know, we just got done uh, a couple months ago teaching the book of Deuteronomy. And we were, we were talking over and over again on how God's law is perfect, it's just, it's right. Yet many Christians today believe it's been done away with. That's, that's, you know, that's nonsense. It's perfect. It actually helps convert the soul. It convicts you. Of, you know, when you look at the law and you look at yourself, you real, it brings you to Christ because you realize that you, as hard as you try, you can never measure up. You can't meet the standard perfectly according to the law. And it brings you to your knees asking for forgiveness. And it lets you know that we are in need of a Savior. We are in need of Christ. We can't get to the Father without Him. Because we'd all be convicted. And tried. And we'd all receive the lake of fire death penalty. Praise God, we have a Savior. The testimony of the Lord is sure. It stands fast. It's solid. It's steady. Just like all the different, um, just like the, the, the stars are. They're in their fixed positions in the heavens. There's your astronomical term there. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. And that's kind of what we're going to try to do here. And, you know, we try to do it all the time in our studies is for uh, for you know for for those on the very basic levels we're all, we're trying to get wise we're trying to gain wisdom we're trying to grow in God's word 
you know, all of us at one point, and we still are to a certain point, simple, simple minded, not completely grasping the thoughts and plans of Almighty God, yet we grow daily toward them, making wise the simple. Verse 8, the statutes of the Lord are right, uh, are righteous, they're equitable, they're just rejoicing the heart. God's, all the, the different minor laws. The commandment of the Lord is pure, is pure, enlightening the eyes. Which verb do you think there was um, uh, an astronomical one? Enlightening. Giving light like one of the stars, like, like, the, like the sun, the moon, or, or, like, or all the different stars. That's what, that's what it's used for. The, God's commandments give light. They're, that pure light. And, um, well, let's, let's move on here. The fear of the Lord is clean, um, enduring forever. You know, just, just like, you know, enduring kind of points out how different, uh, you know, how long. We, we don't even know a lot about, um, you know, scientists guess at the different lifespans of galaxies and so forth, but in, in man's terms... That th even if those things did have a beginning and an ending, it's practically forever. They endure. So possibly another astronomical term there. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. And you'll, you'll see that phrase there. I believe it's mentioned by an angel in the book of Revelation. Where he comes out of the, I think he comes out of the temple and he says, True and righteous are thy judgments, O God. And uh, that the earth, or I think it was Mystery Babylon, was deserving of it anyways. They are true and righteous altogether, more to be desired than gold. Yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey, and as the honeycomb. Now, now think about that. When we study God's law, you know, a lot of people study God's law and they say, oh, what a terrible God, so mean, so cruel, so strict. But yet, somebody who truly loves God and truly wants to understand him rather than accuse him of being a mean, harsh God would take the time to see that God's judgments, his verdicts, his punishments, the things he decides, you know, his decision in a court matter, in other words, are to be sought out as fine gold. Why? Because it teaches you righteousness. It teaches you how to live. It teaches you about God and how righteous and just he is. So, yeah, those judgments, hey, somebody who really loves God is going to study his law. And, you know, remember, remember, all of this is related to the heavens. David is relating this to the heavens. Because God's got different laws that govern the heavens. And they even give us a message of his law as well, as, as is obviously suggested here. Verse 11, Moreover, by them is thy servant warned. And in keeping them, there is great reward. Now, now again, this is an astronomical psalm. Don't overread this verse. He says, moreover by them. Obviously he's talking about God's judgments, but I believe also he's likening this to the message that the stars and the sun and the moon and the planets give us. He says, Hey, moreover by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. In other words, he says, by observing them, the different movements, we are warned of prophetic events to come. Genesis chapter 1 verse 14. Fascinating. And they should be sought out as, as, as a treasure. You know, there are times, you know, when I'm studying this series, I'm like, oh man, you know what, I just... 
you don't want to go overboard and focus too much on one topic. And sometimes I start thinking to myself, am I spending too much time looking into the sun and the moon and the stars and the planets? Could this be astrology? And things like, yeah, sure, it could. You could turn it into that if you perverted the true meanings. But then I come to verses like this and I realize, hey, yeah, these things need to be understood. They need to be sought out as, as you're looking for gold, as though you're on a treasure hunt. Because nothing that God does or creates is meaningless. Especially when we're warned of things to come. He says, by, by keeping them, by keeping the warning, the message that they give, I believe, the, speaking of the astronomical signs, there is a great reward. Just the same as following his law. Verse 12, who can understand his errors? Now, this is kind of interesting. This word errors actually means wanderings. And it's in reference to the planets. Again, the constellations and everything, they're fixed in the heavens. They don't move. You know, I mean, if you get technical about it, over great periods of time, they move, they, they'll move. But day unto day, month unto month, and year unto year, the only things that really move are the sun, the moon, and the planets, as well as asteroids and comets and so on. And those are the things that actually point out to you different messages. And in them is keeping, there is a great reward. Okay, who can understand his errors, those wanderings of the heavenly bodies? Cleanse thou me from my secret faults. Lord, cleanse me. And that, that's something we should all pray for. Uh, you know, I'm not going to go, in, I, I want to teach every aspect of this psalm, but I wanted to show you a couple other verses. So I'm going to just move on here. Verse 13, keep back. Restrain or hold back as though you're holding back the different motions of the movements of the planets. Keep back thy servant. Again, that's an astronomical verb. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. You know, this word dominion has reference to how the sun and the moon have dominion over the earth to give light unto it. The sun by day and the moon by night. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be accepted in thy sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. What's fascinating about how King David closes this psalm is that he calls Almighty God his redeemer. And you know what? That's the message that the entire Zodiac has. I mean, when you look at this, this picture up here, I'm going to pull it up. Not all of these on this program are necessarily accurate. But you see different things happening here. You have, and they all point to the Savior. We have Orion here. You have this, this sea monster over here, which is symbolized evil. You have... Um, Perseus. Then you have the Drago. And I'm trying to get to one where there's a Ophesius, where there's a guy wrestling a serpent. I apologize for moving through here quickly. But I, I guess I'm not going to do it now. We'll go through it at another time. But when you look at the overview of the constellations, the Bible and the stars, there is one prevailing theme. And that is the theme of the war between the serpent and the seed of the woman between two kingdoms. The war between good and evil. The war between Satan and Almighty God. That's, that's what it displays. And the, one theme it, and the one overriding theme of it is redemption or being saved by the Savior who had come through that seed of the woman. So there we have it, a fascinating psalm. If that doesn't whet your appetite for learning the truth that God has displayed for us in the heavens, hey, I don't know what will. But let's go to a couple other spots here while we got time. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 26. Isaiah chapter 40. And... 
40, verse 26, I believe we'll pick it up. Lift up your eyes on high, and behold, who hath created these things? In other words, look up. That bringeth, for, that bringeth out their hosts, or the stars, by number. He calleth them all by names, by the greatness of his might, for that he is strong in power, and not one faileth. In other words, what, what this is saying is, hey, look up to the heavens, and, and look at those stars, all the different hosts, the myriads, the millions and billions and trillions. And realize that God actually has a name for each and every one of them. Fascinating. And the, why is that important? Because we're going to get into we're going to get into it in a, at least our monthly updates. That when different stars are pointed out to us by the wanderers or by the sun or the moon, they they tell a message. They give us a message, and the message often comes by the name of the star, because Almighty God named them. Okay, where is this found again? Let's go to Psalms 147. Go backwards here a little bit. Psalms 147, verses 4 through 5. All right, verse 4, he telleth the number of the stars. He, he, in other words, he, he can count them. He knows how many there, there are. He calleth them all by their name. So God has, again, God's name the stars. Great is our Lord, and of great power, his understanding is infinite. Again, that's another message we should get when looking up at the stars. You know, sometimes I get that feeling just studying this topic. I'm like, you know, th this is such a vast topic that I cannot possibly understand it all. Because God's so big, but yet we are supposed, supposed to try and understand what we can. And pray for understanding. Do like what Christ said. Ask, seek, and knock. And parts of His infinite Wisdom can be revealed to you, can be revealed to us. So there we go again. He names them. Now I want to turn to a spot where a, different couple, a couple different constellations are mentioned. And then I think we're going to probably close it up here. Um, there are many other places we could go to. But I pretty much just want to get your appetite whetted for what's to come. Um help if I was going the right way. Isaiah chapter 40 Didn't we just read that there? I'm sorry. Um Isaiah 13 Isaiah 13 Isaiah 13 and we're going to pick it up in verse 9. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh both uh, uh, cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. What? Now don't overread that there. Are the constellations biblical? Does God? Did God actually... Uh, decide that there were different uh, groupings of stars that should be named or symbolized by different symbols. Absolutely. Are they all accurate today? Possibly some of them are corrupted, but uh, that'll be another topic for another time. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not give her light to shine. And God says, I will punish... Um, I will punish the nations of the earth, and so on. But anyways, another instance in the Bible where astronomical signs are mentioned. So it's not just some crazy astrologer out there reading palms and trying to tell you your future. 
your personal future. So um, let, let's go to, uh, let's get a couple specifics here. Let's go to Amos chapter 5. Amos chapter 5. And I believe this will be the last place we'll go today. And then I'll leave you with a thought to ponder. Amos chapter 5, verse 7. And it reads, Ye who turn judgment to wormwood, and leave off righteousness in the earth. Seek him, seek the creator that maketh the seven stars and Orion. Do you remember Orion? Yes, that's one of the signs. That's one of the constellations. So there it goes right there. It is true. And turneth the shadow of death into morning and maketh the day dark with night. And calleth for the waters of the sea, and poureth them out upon the face of the earth. I believe that might even be in reference to Aquarius, the, the guy with the water jug pouring it out upon the earth. The Lord is his name. So not only did we have Orion mentioned there specifically a, as a consolation here, but also these seven stars. Now the seven stars, there's a consolation called, the modern name of it is called... Um, uh, Pleiades. So there we have it, Pleiades and Orion, two constellations called out by name in this chapter. And again, there are other places where constellations are mentioned. You go to the book of Job. It's all over. It's all throughout the Bible if you're paying attention. So should we pay attention to these things? Absolutely. Because Genesis chapter 1 verse 14 says that God Gave us the sun and the moon and the stars for signs and for seasons and for days and years and, and appointed times. So it's fascinating. One question I always had when studying some of these things was, okay, you look at all the different constellations. They tell a story. You got Virgo the Virgin, which uh, symbolizes um, the nation of Israel as well as the, the seed of the woman Christ. So it tells us that story, that a Savior would be born. And then you look at Draco the dragon and you see, okay, there's a big dragon up in the sky. That's, that's one of Satan's names. So that, that symbolizes Satan. And he's trying to, his tail, you know, is trying to uh, drag a third of the stars from heaven. But how do we know? You know, we see those same things over and over. Every night. Every year. So how do we know when specific prophetic events are being pointed out to us? Well, that's something we're going to get into. Um, I don't know if we're going to do it in our next study or not. I, th I think we probably will. We'll probably look at some examples of what to look for to be able to determine what's actually a sign of something to come. Anyways, hey, I hope you enjoyed this study. Uh, I hope you're enjoying all these studies in the Creator's Calendar as much as I am. I'm having so much fun researching these things, and uh, I'm going to just keep doing my best to bring these to to bring these messages to you as the holy spirit spirit reveals after doing much ask seeking and knocking upon those doors anyways do like what christ said in matthew chapter 4 when tempted of the devil he said man does not live by bread alone but by every word of god so see that you study it meditate upon it every single day so that you can be a Christian Overcomer. Christian Overcomers is brought to you by the tithes and offerings of our listeners. If you'd like to donate, you can do so by going to ChristianOvercomers.com. God bless you and thank you for your support.